So we're going to get started. This is uh, the, the final panel of uh, two days of a wonderful event. Um, my name is Micha Sifri. I am the co-founder and president of Civic Hall, which is um, New York City's uh, uh, collaboration center for civic tech. Um, come visit us if you're in New York, or just go to civichall.org to learn more about us. Um, we have a, a terrific panel, and we're looking forward to getting into also a conversation with those of you uh, who are here in the room and in the first six rows, because I won't call on anybody if they're <laughs> sitting further back. Why don't we just do that? Right, Mark? You know? You want to have you, you, someone? Oh, good. She moved up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the topic is investing in the future of civic tech, and what uh, we are uh, have a terrific panel uh, with three uh, experienced funders. Um, we uh, I apologize because our, our fourth speaker Cassie is unfortunately under the weather, uh, and was hoping that she might be feeling better in time for this panel, and is just um, uh, just suffering in her hotel room, uh, sadly. Um, what I'm going to do, let me briefly introduce uh, uh, the people next to me, and then um, I will throw uh, the opening uh, to each of them to speak for a few minutes about uh, who they are and what they do and how they think about their roles as, as funders of civic tech. And then we'll, we'll talk a bit about some themes that may have emerged over the last two days as, as they've seen them. Uh, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions um, from the audience. So to my immediate left is um, Stacy Donahue, who I have to admit is a old friend and colleague. We uh, worked together uh, when I was an advisor to the Sunlight Foundation, and she was on Sunlight's board. Um, and more recently, uh, uh, Stacy has, well, that was back when she was at the Omidyar Network, and now uh, their uh, civic engagement and governance group has been spun out as, the, as Luminate. Um, and you'll hear a bit more about that, and then I should just say for full disclosure, that Luminate is a funder of Civic Hall uh, and a longtime uh, ally to the entire field. Stacy leads uh, Luminate's investment team across the globe, um, and so she really has a, a very broad perspective uh, on uh, where our field is and where it may be going. Uh, next to her is Lucia, I'm so sorry because I'm probably gonna massacre your name, Abelanda? Yeah, <laughs> Casale, is that right? Abelinda. No. Okay, not bad. Uh, and she's a director with the uh, Fundación Avina, which is based in Mexico, uh, and which has been around since two 2008, uh, building important relationships with different organizations working in the social, business, and government sectors uh, within Latin America primarily, but not solely. Um, and she is a native of Uruguay and lives in Mexico, uh, and she's been with the foundation since 2013. And then finally, all the way over, uh, is Paul Lenz, uh, who is with the Indigo Trust, uh, which is a uh, UK-based grant-making foundation uh, that says it works to create a world of active, informed citizens and responsive, accountable governments uh, that together drive positive change in society. And they primarily fund in sub-Saharan Africa, typically providing small and high-risk grants to projects in places like Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and Uganda. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, everybody has their own mic. Um, but why don't we just work our way down the panel and um, you know, we'll take four or five minutes each to sort of uh, make some opening remarks. Go. Hi everyone, thanks for sticking with us in this uh, very last session of the day. This is the, the dreaded final session, um, but appreciate the energy and enthusiasm. And we promise not to bully anyone, anyone any longer for people who want to be uh, anonymous in the back. <laughs> I'm just teasing. So, um, so yes, I work at Luminate, uh, which as Mika described is the spin out from Omidyar Network. Uh, we were previously the governance and citizen engagement initiative within the broader Omidyar Network. And uh, last October, we spun out, uh, but we still have the same mission um, to create stronger societies by enabling people to participate in governance, uh, to get the services they need, and to hold power to account. And so as part of that, you know, I, I had been, have been with the organization for over 10 years now and started uh, funding civic tech, um, you know, almost towards the beginning. 
um, it, it particularly in the U.S. Uh, and recently, we've had the opportunity to reflect back over the last 10 years of the funding that we've done in the civic tech space um, because of the spin out. And we've learned a lot of lessons. And actually, I just published a blog post about it. Um, but I can share just a few highlights here. So I think the first thing I would say is that the world has dramatically changed in the last 10 years. Uh, that's probably an obvious statement in some respects. But the rise of populism and authoritarianism, uh, the backlash against the intended or unintended consequences of technology uh, have really fundamentally changed both the civic and the tech part of civic tech. In response, there's been ever greater engagement uh, of people in governance, as you've seen with the women's marches uh, across the world as one example. So it's not all uh, negative in the sense that the apathy that we used to see 10 years ago, and even really five years ago, has really been replaced by greater engagement. So that does give me some hope. But the overall context that we're working in is very, very different. And so, you know, because of that changing context and because of some of the things that we've learned by investing in tech-led solutions over the last 10 years, we've actually decided to make some changes to the way we're investing going forward. And when I say investing, I mean both grant making and for-profit impact investing in, in the civic space. So um, the first important change um, is one about language, but it's significant. And so going forward, we are investing in civic empowerment and not civic tech. And on the one hand, you could say that's just semantics and that's just words, but actually it's more than words because what it means is that we have fundamentally recognized that tech is an important thing and an important part of what we're trying to do, but it doesn't work in isolation. And that was a pretty hard realization for us to come to. Um, Mika had not described, but many of you may know that our organization was started by the founder of eBay, Piero Midiar. And so we have a very tech-centric um, legacy, and we really believe strongly in the power of technology to empower people to have impact on their own lives. And what we've seen is that tech in isolation doesn't do it, and in some cases actually has negative effects. So one of the things we're doing going forward is uh, reorienting our focus around the combination of online and offline solutions, which um, many of you in this room, I think, have been doing for quite some time. And so maybe we're a little bit late to the game, but I wanted to recognize that that is a really important distinction for us uh, and a reorientation of our work. Um, we'll still be focusing on both the participation side of civic tech and the service delivery side. Those are the two kind of pillars that we typically talk about. Um, but on participation, as I said, we'll be focused more on um, integrating the online and offline components. And secondly, we'll be focused on trying to get the voices of those who have been underrepresented and marginalized to be heard. So a few, a few years ago, our approach was very much platform oriented, which is to say that we thought about technology as a neutral tool that anyone could use to amplify their views and their voices, and we cared about the act of people being able to use technology to amplify their voice. And for us, the realization, and for me personally, is that we're not here to amplify everyone's voices the same because there are lots of people who already have their voices amplified and technology tends to amplify the power of the people who already have it. So what we're gonna be doing is amplifying the voices of those who haven't had the power and thinking about how technology and offline organizing can do that better. And that's also a really big shift for us. Our legacy was very much neutral uh, we were sort of apolitical, and while we're not partisan, um, we will be assertive in the stances that we're taking about um, who we're trying to represent and work with. Um, on the service delivery side, we will also uh, continue to invest in what some people in the room might call GovTech. Um, for us, that is a subset of the larger civic tech uh, set of activities. 
Um, however, we will be doing that very much with an eye towards solutions that government use, uh, technology solutions that have users and users' privacy and protection at the core. Uh, it's you know, become increasingly obvious that there is a lot of potential danger in the types of technology that governments can use um, to become tools of surveillance, um, to say the least, and that's obviously not something we're interested in supporting. So you know, we'll still be focused on things that are civic and things that are tech, but we'll be doing more than that, and we'll be doing it very much with an eye towards empowerment. That's, I'll stop there for now. Great. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. I think I present Davina so many times in these two days, but I go again. Um, Avina is a Latin American foundation that works in sustainable development. And basically, we focus in something that we call collaborative process. We believe that when we put in a room people with different perspectives, different backgrounds, uh, private, private sector, civil society, uh, media, and academia, we can achieve greater things and accelerate change. That is the basic theory. And we started to change, uh, to use the combine of, uh, we started to work in 2012 with uh, social innovation, and after that we add um, business and technological innovation, and we try to combine the three types of innovation in order to accelerate change, believing that the uh, the use of of uh, business innovation could create more sustainable process, but the the social innovation is crucial to create and uh, to work in the offline uh, field and also the, the, the tech part could accelerate and go cheaper all this process. Um, basically, we, we do many things in Latin America and always we focus in Latin America, so I feel like an infiltrate here, <laughs> talking about Latin America, but uh, yeah, uh, why tech? Uh, we decided to, to, to start to fund tech because we spent so many years we working with traditional CSOs that was, and they started to, to, to be in a digital world. And we find uh, that it was an, an opportunity, but also an, a necessity in order to, to bridge the gap between the civil society organization and this digital world that was coming. Um, so we were, were we were we've been working uh, between trying to to bridge the gap between the reality of most of these organizations in Latin America that are like organizations that work in the biomas that work in the Amazonia that works in in different parts of the region and the use of civic tech. Um, uh, in this work, I think I, I can say after like six years working in the field, that is not so much, that uh, we have like a, like a bigger community in Latin America that we have is in 2012, that we have more than 300 organizations that work with civic tech and they are connected, that they uh, work together in so many cases, we have spaces that that we annually use in order to discuss and have yes, some kind of coordination in some issues that are, prioritized, that are prioritized by the community, that we have like a community that is useful and yes, and, and is, is good for the ecosystem, but also we have, we have a, like a great challenge nowadays that, that I think is that around the community of civic technology and open data, open data, <laughs> is going are are like uh, erasing new communities that are not so well connect, and I think it's a risk not to have this type of of of, of connection. For example, all the um, digital rights community 
that have their own spaces, their own dyna dynamics, but at the end, is part of the same problem. When you are talking about how a journalist uh, have the live uh, risks uh, in, in the field, you are talking about digital rights, but these three digital rights are connected with the technology that the, this journalist is using. So at the end, I think we have a, an opportunity and also we are quite focused on the next year to bridge these communities in Latin America in order to have a more integral sense of the policies of, uh, that our countries are developing the region. Um, also, um, we, we are extremely focused on, on, creative, on creating more bridges between the specific communities that are working in topics like climate change and water and political innovation in the region with the tech community. Not only creating um, like a specific collaboration, but also creating a specific process of common agenda to create like different projects that could really have an impact in the in the region. And um, yes, as, as a final. Uh, as a final thought, we are like rethinking how we work in the region because when we started to work in 2013, we, we were working mainly in co-creation. And we work a lot with all this international framework related to co-creation, but the co-creation nowadays in Latin America is not so possible in many countries, so we are more in a position of resistance or mobilization. So I think how, is, how do we co can combine a process in order to have co-creation, but also with a great component of resistance and mobilizations. Hi, I'm Paul. Oops, sorry, a bit loud. Uh, I'm from the Indigo Trust, which is a relatively small UK-based foundation. We award about 1.3 million dollars in grants every year, uh, primarily in South, Af sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa, as Mika said earlier. I want to reassure you that even though I'm sitting here as a funder, I know what it's like to not be a funder. I spent seven years at my society, seven happy years, <laughs> and during my time there, the single most important figure. The one, the one number I knew every single day was how many days we had until we ran out of money. And that was foremost in my mind all the time. So I don't want you to think that I'm sitting up here just with no concept of what it's like to be a practitioner, an academic, an activist, someone who's having to go out there and actually get money. Um, in terms of my, my reflections over the conference and also some of the earlier comments, I would just like to echo what Stacey said earlier about the fallacy that I think many funders have fallen into, including Indigo, that the tech is an end in itself rather than simply a means to an end. And that having that offline component, be that as a means of engagement, but also in terms of specific activities is hugely important. When I think back to some of the presentations that I've heard, full fact, yesterday, technology is important in there, but actually the hard graft is human beings analyzing and assessing. The presentations that JPAL did, looking at impact, again, the technology there is really simple. It's SMSs, but those are SMSs that can swing elections. And I think that's an important lens for us to look through in the context of this. I've also been thinking about the impact of the work that I achieved when I worked in my society and now at Indigo as a funder. And if any of you were in the earlier session that Luke gave about the work of grassroots, I think it was astonishingly self-reflective. And I fear that as a practitioner and as a funder, I too easily fell into the trap of looking at output measures rather than impact measures. And I'm glad to see that many smart organizations are now really thinking in those terms and facing difficult truths and then trying to find ways to overcome them. And there's a bigger issue that I've been thinking about the last couple of days. Tom Steinberg, the founder of my society, described much of the work that we do as an essential public good akin to having libraries. It's so fundamental for our democratic systems and processes. And as I almost always do, I agree completely with Tom on this point. But I think we've got a problem. 
and I don't think anyone's really talking about it, and that is that this sector is effectively funded um, by the benevolence of smart, wise, and lovely billionaires and some fantastic foundations. But the problem is those billionaires die those foundations changed their strategies. I think back five or six years, making all voices count, $45 million for civic tech. There's just not that kind of cash moving around today. And so the kind of, the, um, I guess, provocation I have, both for the audience and for the panelists, to think about how do we ensure that these things that are so vital can be funded and supported in the long term? And I think back to the library analogy that Tom made, and I think of Andrew Carnegie, the American industrialist. He became the richest man in the world because his wealthy neighbor let him, as a child, use his library of 400 books. And so when he made money, Carnegie went out and he started building libraries. He built 2,500 libraries. But he didn't just build them and fund them. He knew that wasn't sustainable. The communities where he built the libraries had to commit to staff them and repair them in the long term. And in exchange for that, they got those libraries. Now it's a slightly tenuous analogy. But what I don't have an answer for, but what I've been thinking about a lot is how do we have the equivalent of those libraries? How do we have fact-checking? It shouldn't be down to just a small band of people scrabbling for grants. And I think some would argue also it shouldn't necessarily be funded by the organizations who are being fact-checked themselves, following on from the, the earlier Facebook presentation. But as I say, it's, it's a provocation, a question that I don't have an answer to, but I'd be interested to hear what people think. So uh, thank you, Paul, for actually moving us into the sort of the second part of our conversation. Sorry, did I jump ahead too no, much? No, no, that's great. You, you set it up nicely, because what I was going to ask all of you to address, and, and, and Paul sort of opened the door, is, um, You've been here for the last two days, soaking up the conversations and the presentations. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, you know, in addition to the, the comments that Paul made, the other observations or, um, you know, big thoughts that have struck you, I think there was certainly one consistent theme that had, came up a number of times uh, from the very first morning from Bex's uh, presentation, um, and then in a few others was the idea that the field of civic tech has gone through phases and we are maybe in a phase of maturing and consolidation. Uh, and then I, I do remember seeing a tweet from Nathaniel Heller, uh, I don't know if he's in the room, uh, who used to be with Global Integrity, saying it's hard for him to swallow this idea that we are actually maturing and consolidating when so many civic tech enterprises don't quite have a sustainable source of support other than the beneficence of, of foundations. Um, so open question, uh, you know, either engage with, with those observations or if you want to add some new ones to the mix of, of what the last two days has sort of brought front of mind for you. And we'll start again with Stacy, I guess. Yeah, so um, we had a panel this morning that was focused on Latin America, but I think some of the observations uh, are are more global in scope. What really struck me was the, the difference between people in the room who considered themselves activists and people in the room who considered themselves something else. And we had an interesting discussion about what that something else was and whether you could be an activist and also a collaborator with government when it comes to technology and were those two things in opposition. And it strikes me that in the world that we live in now, um, with political movements the way they're going, um, there is kind of a moment of reckoning around civic tech and whether or not it is a, a tool for um, political change uh, or a tool for um, providing services to citizens. And that's always been a little bit of a, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say an identity crisis, but there have been kind of two orientations around the, the community that we broadly call civic tech. Um, and I feel like those divisions um, or kind of orientations are getting ever more stark. And that even on the sort of service delivery side that that we once considered more politically neutral, that that's not even politically neutral anymore. Um, at least in a US context, who gets services from government, what kind of services they get, 
um, those have become very political and partisan questions. And so I'm really struck by and would like to understand better how everyone in the room thinks about themselves as um, a technologist, a, an activist, or something else, and how we can try to weave those things together. Let's ask the room very quickly. How many people here would first and foremost identify as an activi activist, advocate? Uh, you know, you have an agenda you're trying to advance. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, nothing will stop you from doing that. And how many of you would say that you're primarily like trying to work with government in collaboration as a vendor, as a service improver? And, and how many, this doesn't describe you at all? What would you say instead? What would? Researcher. Researcher, okay, yeah. Some, anybody else? Yeah. Evaluators. Okay, evaluator, researcher. Okay, that makes sense. We, there are, we should recognize that this is also a conference filled with academic presentations and, and valuable insights from that. Any other missing identities? Yeah. Media. Media. Good. Yeah. Uh, these funds could be tech with public money, but sometimes those could be tech activists. These funds have ideas that are not attacking. Well, you should be up on the panel. You're a funder. <laughs> <laughs> Great. OK. So the, yeah, so uh, I mean, there is that tension. Um, Sorry, I interrupted. Did you want to finish? OK, go. OK. Um, if I could uh, bring two topics that I think that was a surprise for me that uh, was not, were not so mentioned. One um, is the, who, uh, who, is the, who is the user? We are talking about a lot of participation about people using technology, but in in it was not a big presence of the person who are not connected. Mm -hmm. And around the world, there is a lot of person who are not connected to internet or the use of civic tech uh, tools are quite difficult. I'm thinking perhaps with my perspective of Latin America, but I'm thinking in the Chaco Americano, in La Amazonia, part of Paraguay, even when we think in big enterprises that only give access to a specific platforms, uh, and they have like a restri restringed, restringed, right? okay. Restringido, acceso restringido in Spanish uh, to this to this participation. So it's, it's, it's like a big, huge problem when we talk about inclusive participation. Where, where when we are talking about a mature ecosystem and growing and have a more uh, really to impact in in, in in democracies and to build inclusive democracies, not democracies for the people who live in cities. Um, also something that bring me about a lot is, for example, when I see the, the field in Latin America, we have seen uh, a big amount of new enterprises related to civic tech. If I can, we just finished, a couple of months ago, we finished a, um, a map related to the civic tech ecosystem in Latin America, Explora Latam, if you want to see it. Um, and most of the, of the organizations uh, are, are really enterprises that have, have struggled a lot with the sustainable business model. But at the end, there, for me, there is a, a great area of opportunity. And there is very little conversation about that. We always talking about funding, but and or um, crowdfunding strategies. But sometimes I think we have very little conversation about business model related to civic tech. I know there are so difficult, and we have so many uh, bad lessons about that. But I think it's a good topic to 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 talk in a broader community. Uh, again. I'll I want to echo what Stacey was saying, uh, uh, not simply because I was a media grantee for six years, but um, I think the point... All of us are yes. media grantees, luminate grantees. Um, I think the point you mentioned around service delivery and inclusivity 
is key because, I mean, they're clear examples that if you have online services that you will, will be disadvantaging certain groups. And I think there's a, a kind of a challenge for the whole room, which is that inherently digital services are going to be used by people who are wealthier, more urban, and better educated than the average member of the population. That's true in the developed world, and it's even more true in the developing world. And I think that possibly we have fallen into a trap of even thinking about civic tech almost in isolation. That's unfair. We haven't thought about it in isolation. But we've defined it as a sector, as something, as something separate but aligned to people who are human rights activists or climate change campaigners or a whole host of other things. And the danger is that we possibly become fixated upon the means rather than the outcome. And I kind of think back to like campaigners, um, the suffragettes in the early 20th century in the UK who were producing handbills and posters to try and get their message out there. And I worry sometimes that if we had been funders back then, we'd have put an awful lot of money into the people who were making poster printing machines and were coming up with fantastic designs for the posters to make those you know, activists more effective, but not actually necessarily focusing on what the goals of those activists were. And again, it's not something I have an easy answer for, but I just think that more broadly, looking at this technology in the context of those broader activism movements is important. And to your point about financial sustainability, Mark Ridge will tell you how easy it is to run a, a charity and also a commercial <laughs> organization and be financially sustainable. For years, funders, including the Dear Media, would say to us, you know, what's your sustainability strategy? How are you going to get to a point where you're not going to rely on grant funding anymore? And the truth is, well, we're not. It's really tough, and it comes back to that earlier point I made about public goods. You know, someone has to pay for this stuff, and I'm not sure who it is. Well, I just want to ask on that point, uh, I, I would, it seems to me that there, we do see some civic tech innovations or innovators as, as the sort of, the ideas get carried by, by people um, being adopted by government. Um, uh, one example, in the U.S., we long had uh, a very bad congressional uh, website, Thomas, uh, which caused many efforts to build much better, more user-friendly platforms. Uh, and then finally, uh, through a combination of things, the, the Congress decided itself to finally innovate and make a much better platform that's paid for with public tax dollars. Um, the, the talent that was you know, built up by organizations like Sunlight Foundation or Code for America, many of those people are now working in government, carrying the ideas on. So is that, uh, I mean, that is an exit, if you will, uh, uh, or an impact. Open Congress is dead. I'm sorry? Open Congress is dead. Well, Open Congress is not needed, would be the answer, um, because the Congress itself the, the site, as well as um, Josh Tauber's site, does a good enough job that you, you don't need yet another platform. Um, so that's one, one uh, uh, observation. Another one, I, I want to ask the, the, the panel, and then we'll throw it open to the room. Um, are we, as Civic Tech, doing enough to address uh, uh, the, the sort of platform? I, you know, the, the, the topic of platform strongmen came up initially. Um, uh, with uh, Alessandro Orfino's presentation um, that, you know, that civil society needs to take more of a um, aggressive, strategic uh, approach to deal with the rise of platform strongmen. And I'm wondering if there's a corollary to that, which is the platforms themselves as being anti-civic. Um, and are we, are we not doing enough, or could we be doing something that we're not doing now? Um, to try to address that, that the, the type of healthy civil society that I think we're all imagining ought to be supported. Um, how much are we uh, uh, failing to recognize this, that there's like, um, oh, I guess, you know, it, it's like uh, Jupiter in the solar system. It has this immense gravitational effect on anything that comes near it and it distorts the rest of the field around it. Um, I won't say who I think Jupiter is, but I guess you can guess. 
Um, so is there a, a, a need for the civic tech field to move in that direction in terms of the future? So I think that question is inextricably linked with the business model question because these platforms that we're talking about have been major funders in this space and a lot of organizations have um, ha have relied on that funding and that's something that you know we've really struggled with um, because we have started to take a, a much more assertive stance about um, the activities the platforms are doing to harm democracy mm. and harm people. We were funders of the Dear Mark campaign, for example. Uh, and Dear Mark uh, Zuckerberg? Yes, so okay. for those... Just checking, I'm not on a first name with him. So, <laughs> nor am I. Uh, the, the Dear Mark campaign uh, was a campaign uh, around um, the activities of Facebook in Myanmar, as was mentioned earlier today. Um, and was a social media campaign to highlight the genocide in Myanmar uh, and Facebook's role uh, in leaving hate speech on the platform that was later determined to have directly contributed to people's deaths. And um, some uh, very strong civil society organizations in Myanmar collectively put together that campaign. Uh, and now uh, other countries in Southeast Asia and potentially in other uh, emerging markets around the world uh, have been using that same methodology to try to attract attention to the ways in which Facebook um, can be a tool for terrible things in addition to some of the good things that it's also done. Um, so, you know, one thing that I saw today that I thought was a really interesting signal is um, that the British, I think it's the British Museum, uh, today de decided that they are going to decline a large contribution from the Sackler Trust um, for, uh, for its, um, I guess the Sackler Trust has technically and or in the past done donations to a variety of arts institutions. And this museum decided that they did not want to be associated with the Sacklers because they are, for those of you who don't know, the family who um, had a pharmaceutical company that uh, basically created one of the biggest opioids uh, that has created a huge opioid crisis um, that's affecting millions of people. And to me, that was a really interesting uh, potential future signal for when um, organizations that require funding um, from philanthropy make a values-based decision that they would rather not take the money of an organization that they feel has done societal damage. That was a, a pretty big moment, and I'm not comparing an art museum to a small civic tech organization. Obviously, those two things are very different, but I think there are ways in which um, we might begin to see that organizations decide that they hold different values from the large tech companies that have previously funded them and, um, and want to make different choices going forward. Now the question is, how are they gonna make those choices when they need cash? And I, I'm not naive about that fact, um, but I think it links to what Lucy was saying about driving business models um, that give them alternatives. And what we've seen is that on the service delivery side of civic tech, there are um, more sustainable business models that are available and, and, um, and actually flourishing in some cases, which are companies that are creating digital technologies to help governments or nonprofits provide services better to people. What's more difficult is finding a business model on their participation side, using technologies to have people participate in governance. Those business models are, I would say, unproven, or few and far between. There are a couple of examples I can think of, but it's a much more difficult space. And so I don't disagree at all with you, Paul, that there are some things that are just going to need to be grant funded, that they're a public good and there isn't an alternative. And so the job for us as funders is to figure out how to get other funders in the field to help fund the things that are a public good that don't have a business model. Just quickly on that point, I don't necessarily think it's grant funding that's going to solve... I mean, I think that would be wonderful, but I just don't think we can. anyone could guarantee that in 30 years' time these things could be viable. And I wonder to what extent, as Mika said, they can be potentially 
taken on, those roles taken on by government. And you might go, well, how on earth can something funded by the government be wholly independent? But in the UK, we have the Office of Budget Responsibility, which is basically there to check the sums of the government and hold them to account. Now, that's, it's a rare example, but it's possibly one that could be emulated because it, I'm astonished by the work that people like Cruel Fact do. But I also think it's insane we live in a world where political advertising has to be fact-checked by a third-party organization that's getting by on very limited funding. But do you think um, government organizations would be willing to fund activities uh, the nature of which is fundamentally critical of government? Because that's a lot of what civic tech is. I think we have to see what we can achieve. I, I think that in, you know, if you have a luxury, I was going to describe the UK as a well-developed democracy, but if you've been following Brexit <laughs> at the moment, that is absolutely not the case. What I was saying, if you have the luxury of being in you know, a relatively well-established democracy, then I think it's a possibility. I think it's going to be more challenging in the countries where arguably these things are most needed. So possibly a blended approach where there will have to be philanthropic funding, but where we can see if we can work with developed democracies, UK excluded, to develop some of these systems in ourselves. So you know it's a good sign that uh, the audience wants to start asking questions when they start raising their hands even before they're asked to. So yes, I see a question back there, and folks start thinking of your questions. We have about a half hour, which is great. Um, you had your hand up. Yes, Adriana, yeah. Sorry. Just tell us who you are. Yeah. Yeah, and even worse, I don't even want to ask a question. Of course, I want to state my opinion. Well, would you? If, <laughs> I, I have a rule for that, which is, um, please, if you're going to make a statement, at least make it in the form of a question. Uh, okay. So just put a question. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Adriana Gro. I work for the Prototype Fund, which is a project of the Open Knowledge Foundation in Germany, and the Prototype Fund is 100% funded by public money from the Federal Ministry for Education and Research in Germany. And so I wanted to react to the discussion that was just breaking out, um, which is, for example, we fund one project that works on a Tor network. Um, so it's funded by public money, whereas at the same time, um, some government officials say we don't need a network like Tor, because in a democracy, why should you want to be completely private, there's no one that wants to do your harm, like this kind of uh, line of thought. So I think it is uh, possible, now I have to think how to make a question out of the statement, which is be, um, maybe there are other ways how we can make it, like we are a young pro uh, program, so I don't know if it will work forever, maybe it only works now and it will change in the future, if government changes, for example. So yeah, the question would be, how do we come up with ideas, how we can fund civic tech activists with public money, because I think that's a good idea in a way that it, that it works uh, on the long term as well. Why can't other countries be like Germany? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> Just to a comment on that, uh, it's worth noting that Tor was, uh, and it may not still be the case, but certainly initially funded by the State Department. Um, as a tool to help protect uh, human rights workers. Um, a, a very paradoxical situation that one arm of the government funded something that another arm of the government hated. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, and, and I think the intimation is that it, it could be that some portion of civic tech should actually be, you wanna work for uh, improved government, you should go work in government. Um, and that government needs to open up more, to go back to Jim Anderson's comments uh, at the keynote at lunch, that you know, if more government offices learn how to be more innovative, they will start so soaking up some of the energy uh, uh, and directing it and channeling it perhaps in, in positive ways that right now is more diffuse in, and, and that may only be true for places that where you have sort of relatively healthy functioning, you know, non-corrupt, uh, uh, forms of government. Other questions, comments while we look for questions? Oh, we've got questions over here. Go. Yeah. Um, sure. And then the gentleman in the back. We'll go to him next. Hi. Thank you. I'm Lena Guider from um, Citizen OS. Um, my question is, maybe I just don't know about this, but um, perhaps making governments um, um, like passing a law that a percentage of the budget has to be spent on um, citizen uh, 
I, I don't know, somehow funding some sort of um, civic tech or, or some sort of uh, citizen per, um, participation. I know in Estonia, where I'm based right now, the Ministry of Environment is, is uh, doing this on a larger scale, and, they sh and they're saying it's somehow in the law that um, the environment is kind of like owned by everybody, so everybody has to have a say in it. So it's kind of, they're, they're going, I, I think it's just the, somehow the people who, who are working there, they're really active on it, but they're pushing it through, you know, so it's on some level, it's working. Thanks. Another statement, not in the form of a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, with the red hair. Yeah. It was uh, a question. Ah. Requiring engagement. I mean, you know, there's been participatory budgeting happening on a. Um, small to medium scale in certain countries around the world for, for many years. So that's sort of one form of that. Uh, and Brazil would be you know, a great example of that. In the US, there are pockets of that. So it, there's just been an announcement in the state of California that there will be um, a, a fund for um, the state to be able to deploy more kind of 21st century digital technologies for service delivery. Um, uh, that Kamala Harris just announced. Um, but it's more on the service delivery side and, and creating more efficient government, which is something that, you know, it's hard to say, I don't want efficient government. So everyone can sort of get behind that. I think it's politically more difficult to say we're going to pass a law to, to create a certain percentage of the budget that's dedicated towards technology tools for participation. I mean, I love the idea. I just don't know how technically feasible, feasible it is. Yeah. If, if I cannot, for example, in Latin America, sometimes there is money for the creation of the, a specific platform, but there isn't any money for mobilization. Mm. So even when, when we're talking about a specific and very good relation with some countries like Uruguay and Argentina, that that in some specific cities there are a good relation between some organizations and the government and there is a specific collaboration. In general, in generally, I completely agree with uh, Stacy that the, 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 the money and the resources are related to uh, service delivery and anything for mobilization. You know, just to Stacy's point, uh, in the United States in the, in the mid-1960s as part of the war on poverty, there was a lot of money uh, that went to support local economic development organizations in very poor, like in ghettos. Um, and there was a provision in that law that said these programs had to encourage maximum feasible participation by the recipients of the programs in the programs. Um, this led to the creation of uh, local alternative political power bases, and thus the program was then opposed by all the big city mayors who were being threatened by the possibility that poor people were getting money from the federal government and, and being asked to participate more. Um, and as a result, the whole thing was killed. So, um, and that's before technology. So, uh, <laughs> um, the, the point being that um, power doesn't necessarily want more engagement. Um, and and uh, people who've studied the value of increasing voice in does it change things? Uh, Tiago Pajoto was here before, has written a very important paper on this, uh, has found that if you don't add teeth to voice, uh, government doesn't change. So we have a, a, an ongoing challenge. Gentlemen in the, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry for about intervening earlier. <laughs> uh, my name is Benjamin Hogg. Um, I'm a founder of uh, Regard Citoyen, which is a, a French NGO that is uh, 10 years old and uh, does parliamentary monitoring, open data advocacy, uh, political transparency advocacy, um, running the, main, the French, uh, they work for you. Um, and um, We've been running for 10 years with a budget between, I would say, one and 4,000 euros a year, uh, entirely volunteer, with less than a half a dozen people. Uh, and it's still alive, so I guess 
our sustainable business model is no business model. <laughs> uh, but, Excellent. But of course, uh, we are all exhausted, uh, not sleeping enough, and uh, doing that on the side of our work, of our jobs. Um, so I will ask the same question I ask in such panels every two or three years, uh, but the founders are different, so it's all right. And uh, usually Tom uh, Steinberg uh, uh, raises this question, but uh, he's not here today. So, uh, I mean, he's not here anymore today. <laughs> so the question is, um, why, I mean, can founder uh, at some point try and go find projects that proved that they are already sustainable without money? And imagine what they could do if they were funded. And I, I, I feel like uh, NGOs like us cannot even submit a file for funding because just taking the time to do that takes so much time that we cannot even do anything like that. It takes too much. And also the step is so high that I was saying we have like 3,000 euros uh, to become sustainable with money. We would need probably, we're in France, so if we want to have two people full time and just a small place, that would be about 100,000 euros per year. So that's a huge step and just getting it is pretty much impossible. We, we discussed with some founders in the past, but Western Europe, yeah, you can give up. You can even give up. <laughs> so my question is, yeah, uh, is there, what, what can you imagine for such situation? And do you think there's a possibility in the future to consider such, uh, such organization or? Uh, they just die like we, open we, Congress? Stacey and I were like, talking because at the end, uh, I manage Altec, that is an alliance for, from, for Latin America. And at the end is that, is taking in account that some organizations are quite small. I need more agile process with lower barriers and have, need to have another accompaniment. I don't know if I'm inventing this word, but okay. Um, related to strength and, I don't know, some areas related to uh, gender, communication, and other scenes. So we collaborate with Luminate, with other funders like Porticus and another foundation like CNA in order to have this, this fund and cool, achieve, and reach this type of organizations. And yeah. I've yeah. Um, we, I, I take your question very seriously and to heart, and we have thought about how can we reach and learn about and engage with small organizations um, for whom just the, the application process, as you say, is incredibly burdensome. And, um, and so in some cases, we've done what we did with Avena, which was to start a civic tech fund that Avena could actually um, implement because they had capacities that we didn't have to be able to have that reach out in that application process. Um, but it's something that we think a lot about because one of our core tenets at Luminate is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we recognize that everything about the process by which funders try to find people to fund and the ways that people who want funding try to approach funders is inherently very unequal. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's based on networks of people who know each other, who um, have the same, you know, professional um, sets of, um, of friends, uh, who have the same, in many cases, socioeconomic backgrounds, in the same race, same gender, you know, all of those things come into play and end up with a system in which um, certain types of groups get funded and certain other types of groups um, just aren't even in the flow um, of, of those conversations. And so we're actively trying to think about different ways to approach that problem that are different from the way we do it now. And I think you know, doing funds is one way, but there are, are probably other ways that we still um, haven't figured out and need to work on. But I was wondering, Paul, if, if you had any thoughts on that, because Indigo also does very early stage funding for small... Yeah, not in France, I'm afraid, but no, we but tend to do... Because we're small, we try and find ways of using money that 
where a small amount of money can make a little bit of difference or can help an organization that's not necessarily had any formal history and give them 10, 20, $25,000. And that sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. Sometimes other funders such as Amidia then pick up those organizations when they've had the opportunity to scale. But we certainly haven't, if, if we see someone who's doing an interesting project in the past, we have said, look, even though you don't have an organization right now, we will fund you if you can become an organization and get a bank account, then we will give you some money. I think Stace's point, though, about bias in funders is incredibly true. I've only been in the funding world for about 18 months, and it's so hard, but it shouldn't be hard. I'm just making excuses for myself. It's all too easy, is probably a better way of phrasing it, to to pick people who look like you, be it physically or psychologically, who speak your language, that you can understand. And I think also there's something of a herding aspect to funders as well. You know, if, if I'm approached by an organization, or I hear about an organization, one of the first things I'll do is see, see who else funds them. That's kind of crazy. You know, These people are already getting some money. The people you want to be funding are the ones who you haven't heard of that no funders are talking to. But to answer your broad question about can you go from three or 4,000 euro, euro a year to 100,000 euro a year? I think the hard answer is it's highly unlikely someone is going to fund you like that. What my society did back in the early days, and James Cronin, who's in the room, could probably talk more to it, is they started off with a tiny bit of money, and then they got a little bit more, and then they got a little bit more, and eventually they got up to the point where people were prepared to give them 100, 200, 500,000 dollars a year. Going from that small step to what you rightly say is the kind of money you need, even for a tiny organization, is super, super hard. But in the sense, what you see uh, has an impact on the nature of the organization. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, just uh, having someone paid just to find some more funding, but just being part time, will completely mess uh, the whole, uh, the whole um, dynamic. Yeah, dynamic, but uh, uh, governance. And uh, if you if you change the governance of an organization, yeah, then it doesn't it doesn't have the same spirit. Okay, there are other people with their hands up who haven't had a chance. Let's come to this side of the room, here and then here and here. I see. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the really interesting panel so far. Uh, this is Ariana Kiman from the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. Uh, we're a research and advisory firm, headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya, that specializes in behavioral research. Uh, for social programs. Uh, my question is for Stacy. Um, I was intrigued and, and actually really appreciative of, of uh, what you were saying around focusing on civic empowerment as sort of the next strategy uh, for Luminate. And you spoke a little bit in more detail about the public service sort of delivery angle uh, of your strategy as well, about of tech. I'm wondering if you can provide a little bit more insight into the tactics of what you mean by funding civic empowerment and what that would look like. Yeah, so a great example is an organization that we have already funded called Amandla.mobi that's based in South Africa uh, that has used mobile technology to mobilize and organize low-income women um, in South Africa um, to address issues that are specifically um, happening to them in their communities. Um, be it sanitation or um, high data costs of mobile data. There's a whole number of campaigns that they've organized. Um, and the, the organization includes, of course, using mobile tools to, to communicate, but also in-person organizing um, and protesting. And, um, and it has been very effective. So um, one of the things that we struggled with because of our kind of Silicon Valley heritage was this notion of scale. And we went through a period where we were always talking about scale, everything has to scale, which is also you know, a big kind of buzzword in, in the tech field. And um, while you know, there is something important about that because you can reach more people at theoretically a lower cost per head, um, it really isn't the only way to impact. And so one of the things that we're really coming to terms with now is that you can have deep impact on a small number of people, but for whom the interventions are radically changing their lives for the better, and we've gotten really comfortable with that as the metric that we're trying to, to judge our progress by and not about the number of people touched. And so Amanla would be a great example of that. Thanks. Erhard. Uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Erhard Grafe. I'm a professor at Olin College of Engineering 
Um, and I had a couple of things stuck in my head um, based on the, the conversation over the last 30 minutes or so. Um, Mika, you were talking about uh, this idea that, um, that sometimes the powers that be don't always appreciate participation. Um, and that there's this tension within the civic tech community between those of us who feel that we're activists first and foremost versus those of us that are technologists that might be working with governments. Um, and then there's this spotty history of funders actually giving out enough money for the costs of tech to be properly implemented, capacity to be built, um, and impact to be evaluated. Um, and so connecting all of these three things, I'm curious about our shared value as a community of participatory democracy, which is not the same as the representative democracy that's been on the books um, in the dominant form of governance in all these countries that, and localities that we're working in. And I'm curious about what is our responsibility to actually be convincing those powers that participatory democracy is valuable. How do you as funders see that as part of your responsibility to actually have the burden of proof to convince these folks with that power to understand participation is a good thing? And I'm curious about fitting that into your portfolios. Good big question. <laughs> Anybody? I think you should answer it, Mika. I should answer it. I'm not a funder. I'm a builder. I have to raise money. So I'll, I'll take a stab at it to get started. So one of the things I think is really lacking in this community or field right now is uh, impact evaluation and evidence of impact. And if we're going to try to, it, first of all, align around whether or not we all believe in driving participatory democracy forward as our kind of uh, you know ultimate goal, we have to be able to show to the people we're trying to convince uh, what the impact is. And we don't have a lot of that today. And I bring this up because I know you are one of the people who works on it, and I just learned about your work. Um, so, um, but, but it is something that, that we really struggle with a lot um, in this field because the, the main sort of form of impact evaluation that seemingly is most credible is RCT. And that's incredibly expensive. And so what I would really love is help from people in this room who are impact evaluators and researchers to help us figure out kind of what are the different ways that we could actually study and measure the impact um, on democracy, different forms of democracy, or on service delivery, because as I said, we care about both, um, in order to have more compelling information to try to convince people that this is the right path to choose, because today it's fairly faith-based, if I can use that term, um, and we really need to get more evidence. Completely agree. We have spent like the last week discussing about that, and some of my colleagues and allies even are not agree with this idea that participatory democracy is our common vision, so we need a lot of study and impact evaluation in order to know that before it started to, to act. I think there's another challenge as well, which is that even if you have the evidence, which we don't really have at the moment, you need politicians who are rational, who understand evidence and will actually make decisions based upon it. And I don't think I have any idea how you solve that one. Other comments? Yes, yes, good, thank you. Um, Elisa Zomer from the MIT Governance Lab. So I'm gonna pick up a little bit on the theme about evidence. Um, so I guess the first thing is, thank you guys so much for being willing to learn from failure, like our own as grantees. I will just say that the ability to talk with our donors about what, what hasn't worked as much as what has worked has immensely freed up the work that we've been able to do, um, especially with the work that we do with partners. And so I guess the one thing that is when you start off a top, this session on like the changing global landscape around civic space, the big elephant in the room is that a lot of these populist uh, leaders and governments were voted in by the people, by this very civic engagement and participation that we worked on. And so I think one of the challenges that we're facing as you know MIT, a group based in the north at like a, a academic institution, we partner mostly you know with grassroots civil society groups is how do we think about these questions of shifting power 
um, in closing spaces. Um, and I guess, so that's like, yeah, the, for the question. And then I think we're also trying to think about ideas uh, moving beyond the RCTs as gold standards. What is the bronze standard, which is like what we're trying to do through iterative design, co-design with partners, where we're still using quantity, rigorous quantitative measures and also like how to build the evidence. And so in that sense, like how can funders better support building evidence where you have bricks that come together to build a house rather than like these individual pieces, um, which is just something that we're struggling with within the practitioner and the academic community. Thanks. Um, I just, I, one just kind of initial reflection is that I think it's really interesting how we're using the word popularist at the moment, because it kind of seems to be, it's a bad thing if the mass of people don't agree with us. Now, if you look at the Wikipedia definition of the word, it's somewhat contentious, and some people say it should be removed altogether. But if we think back, we talked about popularism in terms of the Occupy movement and things like that, and we were kind of, that was, a, that was good popularism, and now we're seeing bad popularism. And, you know, I'm a, a wet liberal snowflake person, so I'm equally concerned about the rise of the far-right populism. But I think there's a bigger challenge, which as you say, um, it's not a factor of democracy being broken. It's more fundamental issues about people's understanding about actually what issues affect their lives. And you know, I hate to mention Brexit for the second time sitting on the stage, but hey, nine days to go. Who knows what's going to happen? We don't. You know, these were decisions made by masses of people who won popular votes. Now, OK, Trump didn't win the popular vote, but even so, millions, tens of millions of people vote for... The, they make decisions using efficient democratic processes, and they don't necessarily make the, the in inverted commas, rational ones in terms of their own self-benefit. And I think it's important for us to take a step back and think about, well, what are those broader issues? What is it? How are we failing? Because if we focus on simply making, you know, a more efficient mousetrap, we first need to think about why we have mice in the first place. That was a very clunky analogy, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I will retake a conversation that I had today with Fabio from ITS. And yes, massively uh, in Latin America, uh, people vote some candidates, populism candidates, but I think also that could be an opportunity because at the end, they are there, and we have to work with that uh, to reach and to have concrete themes, uh, themes of work. And to, besides the difference, and we were talking about political difference between uh, right and left, how we can reach and find these specific uh, themes, areas that are the interest, have the interest from both sides in order to create movement and to create actions that could improve and could move citizen participation and could move some issues that are important for society besides the polarization and that this regime had been voted but so many peoples in Latin America. Yeah, I think um, your point is great about populism and, well, if the people voted for it, then isn't that what we're about? But I think the difference is that when people vote a strong man into power who threatens the fundamental uh, infrastructure of democracy, then it's gone beyond what the people want because we're now no longer operating in a system where um, fundamental democratic principles are being observed. Uh, and so where I think you know, we need to focus is not on necessarily um, people's views or opinions on a specific issue, but that people can hopefully come together on agreeing about how democracy is supposed to work and to the extent that um, someone who is theoretically elected into office and becomes an autocrat through slowly chipping away at all the institutions that prevent someone um, from you know, becoming an autocrat, that's where we need to, to orient um, our efforts. And, and uh, yeah, and it's a hard question. I don't know what else to say, except that we need to do something to orient around maintaining democracy. 
Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Go. Yeah. Sorry, I'm abusing my position holding the microphone. Views away. <laughs> Um, obviously, we're talking about investing in the future of, of civic tech here, and we've talked a little bit about impact, and we have to start with the baseline. So assuming you know, today where we are now um, is kind of the baseline for, for future measurement, if you came back and had this panel at Tic Tech in five years' time or ten years' time, what impact, what outcomes would you have liked to have achieved? What would you, as funders, like to be able to sit there and say, well, we invested... X amount over five years in the resources like we have in this room, in the context politically that we're currently in, what would you actually like to, to be able to say in five years' time? What a great ending question. I think what I'd like to see is clear impact that the fantastic tools built by people in this room and far outside it have it's, it's kind of cliched and sappy, but have actually helped improve people's lives in a tangible, measurable way that you can establish wouldn't have happened otherwise. And we definitely know it's possible, and we definitely do see some examples of that. I would like, again, I mean, hey, this is fancy world five years' time. I would like to see democratic systems that are truly honest and just. I would like to be in the situation where people can't place misleading political adverts without it being identified and immediately stopped, be it on a billboard or in a newspaper or on Facebook. That's what I'd love to see. Don't know if we're going to get there or not, though. Mm, I think two, two main concepts, concept, resilient and uh, systemic changes in democracy. Uh, that's cool. To, to build a stronger, a stronger, healthy societies uh, with broader participation. I made the bad mistake of going last. Uh, um, I guess what I would like to see is, first of all, in five years, that we're not still having the debate about what is civic tech um, or and what do we call it. I'm just so tired. Me too. <laughs> I was I was on a panel about that just last year. It was about six months ago. Um, I, uh, you know, I would like to to see that Tic Tac is um, called investing in the future. Mm. It's not about civic tech anymore. It's about the impact um, that we're having as a community that includes tech. It includes non-tech. It includes building democracy. It includes um, getting services to people. And it includes holding the powerful to account. And however we want to do that, with or without tech, that's what I want to see. Well, that's really an awesome place to end. So I'm going to let the, the conversation finish there. Um, thank you for really wonderful, uh, thought-provoking, and, and revealing uh, conversation. Um, thanks to our panel. Thanks, everybody, for coming, especially those of you who moved to the first six rows. Um, I did call on some people further back. Sorry. Um, and thanks to uh, our, our hosts uh, from my society. This is our last panel. What's the, what's the agenda now? We all go out drinking? Um, <laughs> karaoke, yes. Uh, talk to Mark or any of the other people in red shirts to find out about the, uh, the evening festivities planned. And give yourselves all a big uh, round of applause for making it through.